Um, so the first question we have, and then anybody do please continue to put questions in there. We'll, we have time to answer them, so if you have others, please do put them in. So the, the first question that came up there, Joseph, was um, about the, um, the challenge being for livestock manure and why it doesn't include poultry manure, which could have water added and make it a suitable uh, substrate for some of these technologies. Absolutely. So, as I mentioned, the in the first run of this challenge uh, is is focused on dairy and swine manure. We are definitely open to doing challenges in the future that focus on poultry uh, and or beef manure. Um, part of the reason we actually limited it was because of the wet weight, and and we thought it was a bit of a low hanging fruit. But also, you know, just budget constraints to some extent and resource constraints. Um, as we started putting this challenge together, we realized um, it was actually quite difficult uh, in a sense to to sort of think about it from both a dairy and a swine perspective and to be able to to deal with those sorts of the needs of of different stakeholders um to add a couple of more species would have just complicated the process a bit more but we have heard a lot of feedback from uh, a number of our uh, animal egg uh, partners in both the poultry and um, beef industries that they would really appreciate an opportunity to work with us on a project for, for those manure types, and we are certainly open to that in the future. Thank you. Okay, and then we have a question here from uh, Dennis Burke, and um, let's see, Dennis lists a whole lot of uh, technologies there. They're really interesting sounding. I'm not gonna go through the whole list, but there's um, quite a few there on nutrient um, recovery, ammonia nitrogen recovery, um, photobioreactors, things like that. And I'm going to read into his question a little bit and say, I know that there has been a great deal of research and development in the nutrient recovery area from, um, from manure for quite a long time. And um, can you talk a little bit about this particular program and how you felt like, are you adding to this or competing or with some of these existing efforts? How do you see this program um, in this bigger picture? Thanks very much for that question. So in some respects, yes. I mean, I think there are probably some efforts going on that are somewhat similar. We've, we've heard from a couple of folks that there have been a number of farm pilot projects, for example. Um, out in the Chesapeake Bay, we know there's uh, a farm manure to energy initiative going on. And there's just a number of grants that have come out of federal agencies that are, are specifically trying to uh, spur innovation of you know, struvite recovery and gasification and all sorts of technologies. Um, we see this challenge as being a little bit different and adding some value in the sense that one of the things that we, we saw was uh, missing in some of the efforts was the captive audience of the folks who might actually not only end up using or buying the technologies, but literally in real time, they could have the opportunity to say, you know, I like your technology so much um, that I'd actually like to talk with you about a business deal and, and see if we can take this sort of offline and, and rapidly accelerate the development of a technology that meets our specific needs. Um, so I think what we what we feel is that the program is flexible um, and that it really tries to insert that viewpoint of the end user of the technology while also trying to simultaneously tackle some of those market barriers uh, where we've seen the technology co-products um, just kind of sit in piles uh, in production room floors because they can't compete with the price of synthetic fertilizer. Uh, we kind of think, as I mentioned, that in this particular challenge, rather than trying to say what's the best, we can actually just use this as an opportunity to really refocus R&D in a way that makes sense for the end users of the technologies and try to get technologies that may or may not recover, say, 99.9% .9 of all nitrogen or phosphorus, but they recover enough and are still affordable for the end user. So we think that's where we're somewhat different and add some value in this area. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. And um, Beth, if you're available, I'm gonna ask you to maybe bring up the polls. Leslie doesn't have um, have them. Thank you for doing that, Beth, I appreciate that. And um, I'm gonna just follow up a little bit on that question and say I think um, Dennis has presented at both of our Waste to Earth conferences. And so if you're interested in some of those technologies that he listed there, I'm guessing some of them are the subject of those presentations. You can look back at the Waste to Earth proceedings um, and, and look for those. Um, our, our third question here, um, Joseph, is um, from a, a user that 
says he has a, I have an, from Ed uh, Weinberg, he says, I have an R&D technology that can recover um, nitrogen and phosphorus from manure and generate high value fertilizer. However, it became available after January 2016. How can he get um, into the, the challenge program? Hmm, that's a tough one. I, uh, I wish I could say that we could reopen it up. Uh, ultimately, we decided to limit it to the 34 innovators um, who we selected in phase one, and we had a discussion about whether it would make sense to open it back up in the technology design phase, but ultimately decided against it for fairness reasons. Uh, the one sort of avenue that could potentially exist is uh, if you know, if you sort of look at the technologies on our website and, and see the individuals who uh, had submitted concepts in phase one. Uh, some of those individuals gave us permission, for example, to share their contact information uh, publicly. And in those cases, um, if we can share that information publicly and you want to reach out to those individuals, you could theoretically work on some sort of arrangement where you're teaming up um, or adding some new uh, facet to their technology. But the ultimately, the concepts themselves, the original technologies proposed, of the 34 teams are going to be the technologies that we'll be focused on. So uh, unfortunately, we don't have an opportunity to directly submit uh, new concepts into the process at this point. No, I kind of figured that was the case, but I figured you were the better one to answer that question. Um, and you mentioned the possibility that there may be future challenges. Is that something that's um, being considered? Or are you trying to get through this one before you make that decision? Well, I think in terms of, uh, we, we want to see this one come to uh, a successful conclusion. Um, if anything, I think we would most likely uh, focus on a challenge that uh, includes some of the other sectors first. Although I will say that we have had uh, a number of members on our planning committee that have even brought up the idea of, you know, this has been such an interesting effort in terms of allowing us to glean some of the newest emerging technologies out there. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if this was something that was done on a, you know, a, an annual or, or biannual basis? Um, it would be. And uh, one thing we have learned is that uh, these innovation challenges, for all their value and for all their worth, they are very large sort of, in some senses, uh, time uh, intensive processes and resource intensive processes. So uh, to the extent that our resources and, and time uh, allow us to, I think we'll probably try to run as many as possible just because we've had so much positive feedback about this effort. Oh, well, that's great to hear. And, um, and then I'll just also advise Ed that Joseph's email address is on the screen there. Um, it might be good to check with him and see if he's aware of any other um, challenges that might be out there that um, you know are related to this as well. And, and so for the audience, the, the poll's on the screen and you'll need to scroll down to get to all the questions. So even if you answered the top one or two, please do um, scroll through the whole thing and, and answer those questions. They, they really are very helpful in helping us figure out which topics are the, uh, the ones that people really enjoy having in this series and, and how we can do things better. And, and make sure that we're bringing forward uh, presentations that really reflect uh, the cutting edge of animal ag and things that all of you need um, to, information that you need to do your jobs. Um, so thank you for, for doing that. Um, and then the last question we have right now, um, Joseph, is, is each, it's from William Keating, and is each technology offered in this challenge meant to be propri proprietary as far as um, a for-profit business venture, or is each technology presumed to be placed into the public domain? So to directly answer that question, at the onset of this challenge, we at EPA realized that uh, we might stymie innovation to some extent if we tried to control the intellectual property ourselves and essentially asking any innovator that participated in the challenge to, to sign over their IP to us. Um, that's not the case. What we actually hope to achieve in this competition is that uh, we support innovators and get them to a point where their technology is attractive and the audience that we hope their technology will be attractive to are the, the folks who could potentially buy the technologies, angel investors, 
um, funders, um, and even to some extent, uh, help them get their uh, technology designs to a point where they might more readily uh, get some federal funding, things like conservation innovation grants or a number of the grants available at USDA and in, in the Rural Development Office. So I think it depends on the situation uh, whether or not the technology will be public domain. Um, ultimately, we here at EPA don't intend to uh, be the ones negotiating intellectual property and patent agreements with the, ind the innovators individually. Um, rather, we would allow for the market, um, in quotation marks, uh, end users of the technologies, investors, um, if they're particularly interested in technologies that emerge in a result of this challenge, they would approach those innovators directly and broker their own uh, contracts. Thank you, Joseph. Appreciate that. Um, there's a, a question in the in the chat, um, and then Beth, if there's some other polls too, you could take this down and, and bring up the other ones. And after, uh, I'm not sure how many there are, but um, after you see the answering start to slow down, go ahead and bring the next one up each time, please. Thank you. Um, uh, one other question in the chat there was, what about connections with energy conservation and, and sustainable agriculture projects um, to be included in the challenge? I'm not sure. Um, from that, it's from Carl, if, if you want to elaborate, Carl, but um, are there connections with the energy conservation and sustainable ag that you're seeing emerge in this challenge, Joseph? Yes, there are, and uh, the, the one I had mentioned was more energy generation in terms of the connection to thermal or anaerobic uh, digester created energy. However, some of the technologies are inherently energy saving technologies, and, and that's sort of the crux of the proposal is that uh, it may be a technology that's already in use like a centrifuge, um, but the innovator has proposed a way to swap out some sort of widget here or there that will ultimately make the uh, increase the efficiency and lower operating costs and thereby energy also energy inputs. Um, in terms of the connection to sustainable agriculture, I think really the, the whole effort is focused on a, a sort of closed loop um, system. And uh, what we've been hearing a lot of is that there are a number of producers out there who, uh, you know, recognize that uh, they they ultimately have a very valuable resource that they want to use. They want to get their organic matter back in the soil. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Jill, soil health is very important to, to producers across the board. Um, but that there's some manure management needs that are, uh, you know, or, or manure management challenges that they're trying to overcome that have just sort of really like hindered their ability to use the nutrients in the exact way they want to have them in the exact plant available form that they want to be able to export the the amount they need to export but still keep what they need on hand and ultimately I think you know the the goal is you know kind of closed loop systems and then sort of in a separate parallel uh, track uh, there's this idea of what if it's possible to link up uh, many production systems so in cases where the technologies are just too capitally intensive uh, for any individual producer to use uh, there could be a new model that emerges where um, farms are sharing manure um, to a central treatment facility uh, where these nutrient products are being generated uh, or even that a third party, uh, someone that's not a livestock producer, um, owns and operates the technology, even a mobile technology that moves from farm to farm and provides a service of treatment um, for the farmers um, rather than it being individually owned. So I hope that answers the question. If there was any elaboration, I'm happy to address that as well. Okay. Yeah, I don't see it. I, I see we are having a problem with one of the polls. It um, says check as many as apply, and um, it's set up as just a um, as a uh, just pick one. And uh, we apologize for that. It was just overlooked when we set it up. For now, I'll go ahead and just pick the one that uh, that is most relevant, and, and that'll be that'll be great for a response. Um, then the last question that I have here, Joseph, is. Um, any collaborations or partnerships with USDA's SBIR, which I believe is the Small Business Innovation Research Program. Um, SBIR also supports small businesses and innovative technologies in several topics, including um, nutrient management. So, any collaborations there? 
Yes, indeed. So uh, in terms of the uh, arms of USDA that are collaborating on this particular effort, uh, in a formal capacity, we are working very closely with uh, both NRCS and rural development. However, um, we also have had a number of conversations with the folks over at NIFA where SBIR is housed out of, um, and also the SBIR program at the Department of Energy. Um, so both of those organizations have kind of, uh, even as we were moving through the criteria development phase, uh, gave us some input in terms of, you know, here's what we'd look for when we're trying to think about a technology that's being proposed whether or not it's it's going to be able to get to commercialization. Uh, so we've been coordinating with those offices in a very practical way to develop criteria and think through the program. Um, but also um, at the Nutrient Recycling Challenge Summit in March, uh, we gave an overview of all of the federal available programs that we found some direct connection uh, to nutrient recovery technology uh, in terms of perhaps a grant could support uh, some facet of development, whether it be the energy generation component or, or the system, uh, the nutrient recovery system proper. Uh, and going forward, we are um, even talking about coordinating uh, directly with SBIR to uh, work on topic areas to make sure that nutrient recovery technology and animal manure is a, a focus area in those grants. Okay. Thank you. And then there was a, a, a somewhat related question in the chat there as far as is there any collaboration with conservation districts or RCND, which are Resource Conservation Development Councils, um, which used to be attached to NRCS but are independent now. Any collaborations on that more local level proposed? So a lot of conversations but no formal collaboration to date because uh, primarily we see that collaboration becoming very essential once we get to the point where things actually start to get built. And once we've identified some locations where the technologies will be constructed and demonstrated, um, it's our intent to work very closely with, um, first of all, our own EPA regions, but then, very importantly, through the, the conservation districts uh, to coordinate those, those testing and pilot projects. Yeah, that seems like a really logical place to, to do that. Thank you for that. Um, there is one more in the chat that I'll ask about. It says, do you think that closed-loop systems may be too idealistic in areas where there are high concentrations of nutrients? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so in those cases, um, if there are just clearly too many nutrients in a, in a given area, uh, I think the, the focus of the technology there would be to uh, get the volume down, get the weight down, and get the marketability of whatever nutrient products are generated uh, enough so that those nutrients can be transported greater distances. Um, some of the markets that we're thinking and hoping that these products will ultimately reach aren't just uh, necessarily other farmers, but things like lawn and garden stores and even the bigger uh, fertilizer industry at large. Some of the, the products that these systems uh, propose to generate are actually elemental products that could be plugged into fertilizer blends, things of that nature. And one of the things we are going to do in the course of this challenge uh, in, in later phases once things start getting built is also try to loop in uh, the retailer side of things and the fertilizer side of things to the extent possible and, and identify some of those high value niche markets that might make for that economic transport more possible. Thank you. I. This is really amazing to me how much how much groundwork you've been doing and, and how many connections you've made. That's really um, really remarkable and, and, and a testament to how much you're working to, to really make this successful. 